Welcome to The Bo Show, the home of faith, family, and freedom. This past year, Dictionary.com selected the word woman as the word of the year, as searches for the term doubled in 2022. The fact that searches were so numerous for the word tells us that the origin, value, and meaning of the term came into sharp focus. We saw Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson be unwilling or unable to provide a definition for what a woman was when asked in her confirmation hearing. Much of this has to do with societal evolution or perhaps societal engineering over what a woman actually is. Cambridge's online dictionary has actually changed the definition. A woman can now be defined as, quote, an adult who lives and identifies as female despite having been said to be a different sex at birth, unquote. It also listed some new examples, such as she was the first trans woman elected to a national office, and Mary is a woman who was assigned male at birth. A spokesperson for the Cambridge Dictionary told The Telegraph, quote, our editors made this addition to the entry for women in October. They carefully studied usage patterns of the word woman and concluded that this definition is one that learners of English should be aware of to support their understanding of how the language is used. The first definition at the entry for woman remains unchanged and continues to be an adult female human being." Unquote. Merriam-Webster has also added a secondary definition of female that defines the term as, quote, having a gender identity that is the opposite of male, unquote. Now, I find that peculiar because we have to bear in mind that as a movement tries to change the definition of woman or female, there is a certain amount of gender fluidity, their words, not mine. That means that the polarization of being a male or female is now blurred. If the goal then is to be non-binary, then why define gender at all? Why not be one big androgynous race, like Pat from SNL? What a wonderful surprise! <laughs> a lot of people say, what's that? It's Pat. A lot of people ask, who's he or she? A man or a sir, accept him or her, for whatever it might be. It's time for androgyny. Here comes Pat. What these new or alternate definitions are doing is presenting a new way the language is being used, but by a specific lobby of people. The attempt is to disconnect identity from sex. Language is a powerful tool, because if language can be changed, so can the culture, rules, rights, laws, and many other consequences. Jordan Peterson has talked extensively about this. What used to be a push for gay rights has now expanded into trans rights, and part of that has been to reshape the language. However, caught in the middle of all of this are the biological females who are trying to advance in life, personally and professionally, but now find themselves in a quagmire. The biological males who are transitioning to females are calling themselves women, and so it could seem that, wow, finally, men are stepping up to the plate for women's equality. But wait, that's not entirely true. It is men who have taken on all the identities and aesthetics and qualities of women, calling themselves women, that are all now for equality and women's rights. It's like, wow, men are becoming feminists by becoming women? So rather than respecting the dichotomy of male versus female and supporting one another, it is an ironic twist that men who want to be women are now championing the woman's cause. This is all the framework for the recent Miss Universe pageant, who has a new owner and is upending the pageant world, but also redefining what it means to be an empowered, sustainable female in a world where the definition is changing. The precursor to the modern Miss Universe was the international pageant of pulchritude in 1930 in Galveston, Texas. It was discontinued in 1932 due to the Great Depression. The modern Miss Universe began in 1952 by Pacific Knitting Mills, a California-based clothing manufacturer and producer of Catalina swimwear. 
1996, Donald Trump bought Miss Universe from ITT Corp, bringing with it a broadcast deal at NBC. In June of 2015, NBC canceled all business relationships with Trump after his comments about dangerous immigrants as part of his nascent campaign for the 2016 presidency. Trump bought out NBC's 50% stake and then three days later sold the whole thing to William Morris Endeavor IMG. While Miss Universe had had hosts such as Dick Clark, Alan Thicke, and Mario Lopez, Steve Harvey was chosen as host in the post-Trump era and made this costly mistake. Wow, that was painful. What a disaster. While previous iterations of Miss Universe had been held in prestigious cities and venues such as the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, Citibank Hall in Sao Paulo, and Atlantis in the Bahamas, the most recent pageant was held at a convention center in New Orleans, not even the Superdome. Miss USA and Miss Teen USA held even less prominent venues and TV broadcasts, from CBS and NBC down to the FYI network or online. In October 2022, Miss Universe was acquired by Thailand-based JKN Global Group for $14 million. The owner of JKN is Anne Jakapong Jakru Jutatip, a transgender woman. For the purpose of this discussion, I will call her Anne for ease of pronunciation. The pageant re-upped a broadcast deal with the NBC-owned Roku channel. Anne's career is not very well documented. She helped run her parents' video business, and then she became CEO of JKN in 2018. She's also the founder and director of Life Inspired for Transsexual Foundation in Thailand. Headlines report, quote, Thai transgender business mogul Anne Jakapong just made history as the first woman to own global beauty pageant Miss Universe organization in its 71 year history, unquote. But is this accurate? Is Anne the first female to own Miss Universe? Or is she the first transgender to hold that title? Anne told the Times of India that she always felt like a woman, but her parents weren't supportive of her. She said that she would often put on her mother's clothes as a child and wanted to become a girl. Despite her parents' opposition, she began her transition while she was studying in Sydney, Australia. However, she decided to retain her original deep baritone voice as she considers it a part of her identity too. Now, that's remarkable because a deep baritone is indicative of a more male quality. However, her physical appearance is entirely aesthetically female looking. Anne fled home at age 35 and after 10 reconstructive surgeries over three years and living like a mummy for months, Anne finally completed her transition. She said, I could finally be the girl I'd been seeing in the mirror for 36 years. I am 100% woman now. According to the South China Morning Post, her Instagram posts show off her extravagant lifestyle, complete with Aston Martin cars and private jets. According to Forbes in 2020, she was the third richest transgender person in the world at the time, holding an estimated net worth of 210 million. This puts her wealth above former Olympic athlete and TV personality Caitlyn Jenner and Lana Wachowski, one of the directors of the legendary Hollywood trilogy, The Matrix. Anne has stated of Miss Universe, quote, we seek not only to continue its legacy of providing a platform to passionate individuals from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and traditions, but also to evolve the brand for the next generation. In this new era, she has described the pageant as the number one beauty Olympics in the world, but added that the system is not just about beauty, it's about the iconic woman, beauty, brains, and leadership, unquote. So let's really think about these things and take it all into context in a very sober, cerebral perspective. Anne was a boy who says she went to an all-male school and got bullied as well as sexually harassed by a teacher. Well, no one would support that type of treatment. But we also have to think about some of the things that transgender teachers have been doing in our own American classrooms, as well as the interactions with minors. You may have heard about Rebecca Phillips, who recently showered next to a trans woman at the YMCA in Santee, California. As a 17-year-old minor, 
Phillips was showering after a swim and noticed a naked man. She rushed back behind the shower curtain. Now, per the YMCA's policy, which is based on California policy, they have accommodated trans people to shower in the same facilities as girls, minors or otherwise. Here's what she said to the city council. I ran into a bathroom stall to change as quickly as I could, organizing my thoughts to share with the people at the front desk. As I did so, I could only think of my five-year-old sister, who I bring to this gym during the summer to, sorry, to enjoy their water slides. This is the YMCA, where hundreds of children spend their summer afternoons in childcare camps. This is the YMCA where my little sister took gymnastics lessons. The locker room was supposed to be her safe haven to gossip with her friends and shower and change. When I asked the YMCA management what their policy was regarding transgenders, they confirmed that the man that I saw was indeed allowed to shower wherever he pleased. As long as you are not a red flag on Megan's Law, the California Sex Offender Registry, a grown male can shower alongside a teenage girl at your YMCA location here in Santee. I was made to feel as though I had done something wrong when I talked to people at the YMCA. Somehow, the indecent exposure of a male to a female minor was an inconvenience to them. So we know that transgender women, meaning men who identify as female, do not always possess the identical anatomy as women, as some can be preoperative and some can be postoperative. Either way, the exposure of genitalia to minors, male or female, can be upsetting. The policy of the YMCA, in attempting to be inclusive, per California's loosey-goosey policy, allows that kind of adult-minor interaction. 